Hello and welcome to Who Dares Worlds TV. I am your host, Mike B. Um, and today it's uh, review day. Huzzah! We love a review day. So today we're going to be reviewing a game we previously reviewed on, on the main website, which is Terrifying Mars. Um, so that's nice. Um, so, as I'm about to sit down and do reviews for the expansions, I thought let's do a refresher course. Let's do a review of the base game on video, as the expansion ones are going to be also on video. Um, so, uh, yes, they can all nestle together like a litter of space kittens. Uh, right, uh, so I'm going to sit here and uh, basically um, speak to you like a performing monkey so that you don't have to read the stuff off the website. So spurred on by uh, the possibilities of a brief dalliance with life on the red planet via some movies and some TV shows, uh, a handful of designers were inspired to take a hard science approach to the colonization of the red planet. So let's do a brief potted history of the most notable. Um, so there was Martians, a uh, story of civilization, which was a kickstarter bloated effort. Um, it was first a lift off um, but didn't really stick the landing. Uh, it was uh, mired with rule book issues, uh, complexity versus a rule book that didn't. Well, basically, rule book was probably written for a different game. The result of all this was it plummeted to, into obscurity faster than a Britain's Got Talent contestant. This left the race open to the Red Planet Retreat 2. Basically, two big boys. It's Portals, uh, First Martians, and Stronghold's Terrifying Mars. So it was kind of a neck and neck. Um, you know, I personally had a. a, a was quite taken by the idea of Portal's uh, First Martians. It was going to take the idea of um, Robson Crusoe, which is a game I adore. It's a brutal, brutal game, but I adored all its various mechanisms. And it's a game that's, you know, initially in its first printing had issues. Um, but that was going to re-theme that, re-implement it as this Martian civilization-y terraforming joy. And it was taking a different trance from what essentially looked like the Stronghold's effort to be a very kind of dry Euro field game. Sadly, Portal's Martian expedition was kind of caught almost in development hell. Um, and then there was lots of uh, puffery sort of blown up around it, lots of reviewers, lots of big media types were kind of pushing it, very excited. There was a rave. It kind of built this sort of wave of expectation, um, which was sadly uh, not necessarily very helpful when it launched. Um, so when it eventually released with a uh, woefully inadequate rule book, and a, a, a 50 minute instructional video from a, everyone's favorite Canadian. Uh, and most of uh, all the original mistakes that Crusoe had made, that was the, probably the biggest, biggest pain, the biggest heartache for me was it, it, it recreated every single possible problem that Crusoe had had when it first came out. Didn't learn from that, didn't, uh, didn't move forward. Sadly, it, uh, and it was kind of pretty much stillborn at that point. That was it really, which brings us in a roundabout kind of meandering preamble to Stronghold's uh, terrifying Mars. Um, so that's uh, that's get the elephant in the airlock out of the way straight away. Um, terrifying Mars. It's not the prettiest game. Now, things have moved on. Since I last, or once I wrote the original review, we had the god-awful player boards, which were not like these player boards. So in the recent uh, turmoil at Kickstarter, they finally upgraded the actual player boards, which is, as this is a game that involves lots of cubes being on these things constantly, and I've done it myself, there's a table jog, is basically the end of your game. Um, now, that's a start. Component-wise, everything, it's, it's a game that kind of grows on you. Um, Initially, it isn't the most handsome game. Some of the art is, is a bit shocky. It looks a little bit like some of its clip art. Um, and, and there is an alternate dimension somewhere where FFG or one of the other big publishers got out of Terraforming Mars and produces lavish, gorgeous version of it. Um, but I mean, it's selling like the proverbial hotcake. So, hey, you know, if it ain't broke, then give some more money to Stronghold Games. <laughs> but no, it, okay, so it's not pretty. It does grow on you. It does grow on you. Um, it's just a shame that the component quality um, and the art and design, everything is a little bit, it's a bit lackluster. It's not as great as it could be. But fortunately for us, the gameplay is very interesting. So at first glance, uh, Terraforming Mars looks uh, incredibly complex especially about mid-game point if you walk, walk in on it, um, and drier than a camel in a wind tunnel. Uh, what makes Terraforming Mars the success it's been, um, in my opinion, um, is the ease to teach 
uh, and combined with the multiple paths of victory. Uh, results in uh, offering a fresh challenge every time you come to the table, every time you play this game, it's different. Um, and in my world, replayability is king, and this makes the game very kingly. Players play as a corporation, each with a perk, ability, or another bonus that gives you uh, a much needed kickstart at the start of the game. It gives you uh, an idea of potentially a path to go down, um, to forge with your corporation, something to to work towards building an engine. And this is an engine building game. In fact, whoa, 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 that's back up a tad. Come back to me, come back here. The goal of the game, surprise, surprise, is to terraform Mars. Um, now, the game ends once all the main requirements of the game are completed. Hence, we've terraformed Mars. So that's the air is at four max, oxygen is four max, the temperature has been raised, raised to the full point. Um, all the oceans are out on the table. I mean, so the planet is then been terraformed. At that point in time, we will score points and you'll score points based on what you've got on the, on the actual planet itself which kind of is like an area control -y type stage of it but also the cards you've collected throughout the game and they can have points on them or generate points so there's, there's a heady mix uh, of stuff that can essentially give you a score at the end of the game. The options you've got then are kind of fairly open. They can concentrate on just the terraforming tracks, just focusing on those main points of terraforming the planet. But um, there's just as much as you can generate income on there to bring you more cash in, or you might be focusing on awards and milestones which are available in the game, um, or just generally focusing on your cards and the points that they are generating you. There's this, this there's a good mix of stuff. And as I say, each time you come back to it, there is and always will be a different strategy, helped by which by the large stack of of Terraforming Mars cards that come with the game. Um, if you've read the Mars trilogy from Kim Stanley Robertson, uh, then a lot uh, of, of this is kind of will sound familiar. Essentially, what you're getting is an unofficial uh, board game of that multi award winning book series. Um, it, it takes a lot of stuff like the corporations and the, and the generational change um, and the tech and the science that's going into it. And there's lots of loving homages or nods to the, the book series and generally some of the other sci-fi stuff that went around. I mean, and if you're not literate or um, you don't want to read, then fine. There's uh, there's the fantastic Martian with Matt Damon and his potatoes um, and uh, and the Mars TV show, which is, I believe, available on Netflix at the moment. So all these wonderful things you can have a look at if you're feeling suitably inspired by the theme. So to actually play the game, it is simplicity itself. On your turn, you can complete one or two actions, or you can pass. Um, the round keeps going round and around and around like an elephant on a merry-go-round until such a point as everyone has passed. At which point in time, that's the end of the round, or you generate stuff, they do an income stage where essentially all your cards and whatever's producing stuff will produce stuff. Um, and then we rinse repeat, we pretty much do that and you just keep doing that until such a point as I say, all the main goals are met. One of your actions are going to be one of a few things, really you're going to be playing a card um, and they are going to be either an action, a card that instantly has an effect on the game. Uh, some of these are instant, some of them are cards you put down to give you an action you can do in later turns. Some of them will just generate you resources. Um, some of them have uh, requirements that you need to meet. It might need a heat level or an oxygen level to be met before you can actually play those cards or certain stuff on the board. Um, and again, what's quite interesting is that if those thresholds have been surpassed, they've been gone past, there's some cards that are just later stages of the game you won't be able to play. That's the one thing you should be doing. You can also be doing standard uh, projects on the board. There is various standard projects, which are quite costly to do, but if you find yourself in a position with a lot of money and nothing else you can do, you can do that. You can fund, uh, fund awards um, or milestones, which are going to be end game scoring pointing. Um, and then there's lots of board actions on the on the actual board itself. So there's going to be putting down greedy retards, which are going to increase your terraforming rating and um, push up the oxygen levels. Uh, and also the end end game scoring is where you've located cities against um, oceans and, and forests will also score you additional points. So you may just focus your game on doing that. But that's it really. In truth, that is all this. It's, it is a very simple game, which I think is why it has captured somebody's interest. And it's an easy game to teach, um, which is what I adore about it is. It is base game. There is very simplistic, actually, to be fair. You're going to do one of two actions um, and it passes around the board and that's it. You're looking at your cards, you've got time to read them. And, and that's the game. I think that's why its popularity has endured, is that infectious random element of the game. Also the fact that you, you do have this, you know, this very easy to sit down, just get cracking to be taught really easily. So it means that 
all levels really can join in and play the game. It's not one of these huge heavyweight sort of scary Euros that as a 45 minute rules exploration beforehand. Um, and you know, there's a thing I think which is why I found so um, refreshing about it when I did do it. What other things do I like about it? Well, there's the vicious streak that's uh, just simmering below the surface. For the Euro game, it has some cards in there that shall allow you to do horrible things to other players, which we all love doing something horrible to other players, and it's kind of refreshing that it has those elements in the game. Negative things for it, I mean, yes, it plays long. With four to five players, this can be a bit of a time hog. You're talking a good couple of hours. There is a lot of cards on the table towards the end of the game. Um, so you're going to be playing a lot of cards and cubes on boards. I mean, it is all the epitome of a Euro game. Yet, it never really gets boring. Um, even if I'm sat there for a couple of hours, flicking through your hands of cards and, and, and looking at the combinations of what could be done. Um, it, it's a game that I enjoy playing. Uh, and I mean, that's all we come to play board games for at the end of the day, isn't it, really? Now, some have bemoaned uh, that the big stack of cards mean that, uh, that there's less chance of, of getting that strategy. But actually, uh, what, if you're drawing cards fairly regularly and you get draw every round and there's cards that allow you to bring draw more cards, there's always something you can find or you're holding stuff back and like that that's i think is what is such attractive to the game is that you're holding this hand of cards that have got these possibilities in them and you're kind of constantly kind of rethinking oh if you draw a new card ah oh, that's another ranging opportunity that's another route to go um just lots of possibilities it's something that keeps the old the brain firing and interested as you go through the game so there you go it that is terraforming mars a very brief overview of it a real brief idea of how we like it I mean, we enjoy it i we i i enjoy it it's a it's a good game i'm not the male's biggest euro fan but it's it's one that's captured my imagination and and, and one that we play it's as i say it's an easy game to get to the table it's an easy teach and, and there's a lot of variety to the game. It always plays out differently. Um, so if you any of that's of interest, then you might be able to track down. I think the only negative points I would say about the game is it can be expensive. Um, it's a bit overpriced for what it is, and it is a shame. Um, there's vicious rumours of a deluxe version some point down the road. And there's vicious rumours of a legacy version of Terraforming Mars, which is interesting. Um, something that has always kind of interested me when they mentioned it. But that is the overview of Terraforming Mars. That is how it works. I hope that's of some help to you. Uh, and in a subsequent video coming up, what we will do is I will run through all the expansions for the game um, and see how will they alter this base game and what they bring to it, are they good? Are they something you should own? All right then, well, thank you very much. Uh, I am Mike B of Who Dares Rolls fame. Um, this has been Who Dares Rolls TV. And this was Terraforming Mars. Um, until next time, goodbye, and lift off and live long and prosper. Thank <laughs> you.